Praise the Lord. Heaven without people will be without white people would be boring. And heaven without black people who know how to dance. Because white people don't know how to dance. <laughs> it would be fantastic to have black people in heaven. We also have CS Germans here. Can you stand up, please? Uh, <laughs> when I was in Germany, he interpreted for me. He was translating for me. He was a little bit thinner before he got married. <laughs> So when you get married, you must know you go this way. <laughs> yeah, women know how to cook. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> I've got my brother, Joseph Nota. That's a Zimbabwean name, but he's based in P Pretoria. And he's uh, the director of the Dorothea Mission. Dorothea means the gift of God. That's the meaning of Dorothea. And it's a ministry that led me to Jesus. As a gangster, a murderer, it was that ministry that led me to Jesus. So, brother, come here. Let me introduce you, <coughs> that you are the most handsome man in the world. <laughs> so, uh, Joseph was saved as a young man, and uh, I've seen him growing up, grooming him, and now he has become the director of the Dorothea Mission. After 76 years, uh, the mission was led by uh, white people, so for the first time, he's the first black man taking over um, the ministry. And so he will need your prayers to support him in your prayers, and just pray, pray, pray for Dorothy and Mission. Uh, many thousands of people come into the Lord. And so we need to commit him to the Lord as he takes these reins. It's tough, but uh, with your prayers, he will do it. Amen. And there are pamphlets, uh, brochures there outside uh, of the Dorothy and Mission. Just simple, and it will tell you who Dorothy and Mission are and... Uh, and we need to lift him up in prayer as he takes the reins. He's just two weeks as the director. He's still shivering. <laughs> and, uh, and we thank God he's married to only one wife and uh, one son. So one son is now 20 years old, a young boy like him, not tall. But we thank God for him. And we pray, please, please pray for for the Dorothea mission, that God will bless that ministry because there are many other Stephen Lungus outside and they need to come to Christ. And it was this ministry that I wanted to blow up their gospel tent meeting. And so please commit them to the Lord as you pray for any ministry like Angus Buckham and um, Scripture Union, all these need your prayers that God will bless South Africa. Don't let us put God in a box of a, of a name, but let's lift up God to save many lives, to come into the kingdom of God. Because souls are like on the conveyor belt going into hell every second. There's someone going to hell without Jesus. So we must pray, pray, pray. Amen. Oh, man, Stephen Bush, amen, is boring. Amen. amen. That's fantastic. Amen. So, brother, God bless you. And uh, as you go out, please pick up a brochure. There are only about 60 or so. Um, and then scribble your name uh, that you'll be praying and receive the newsletters from the Dorothea Mission. And I be they've made me the chairman, international chairman, of the ministry of Dorothea Mission. And so I'm becoming so many organizations, I'm a chairman. Uh, <laughs> but I think they know I'm tough. <laughs> but uh, God bless you, and uh, please pick up a brochure as you go out after this meeting. Amen? amen. Praise the Lord. I like the amen of Angus. Amen! <laughs>
Okay. Let's go quickly because of your watch, which you love so much. Uh, in, in Malawi, we don't look at watches because we love Jesus too much. <coughs> and here you look at watches because you love this gadget too much. <laughs> and also your food and biltong and so on. But uh, in Malawi, we love Jesus too much. When we start the service at 6 o'clock, it ends up at midnight. And uh, that's how we love Jesus. You know, when you, when you fall in love, you don't want to talk with your girlfriend for to, two minutes. You want it to make it longer and longer. Uh, <laughs> and it drives slower and slower. And slower. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> yeah, so when you are in love with Jesus, you want to spend quality time with him. Amen. Praise the Lord. And I want to read from the book of John tonight. The book of John where I will base all part of my testimony because of the new uh, uh, students who are here who have not heard. If you have heard my testimony before, uh, I'm not going to apologize, but enjoy it. Amen. <laughs> I'm not going to apologize. Because I love to talk about Jesus. And I can spend hours and hours to talk about Jesus. As I said last time, normally I'm a fast driver. I drive very fast. So you have to be praying when I'm driving. But when I'm with my wife, I drive 10 kilometers an hour. Because I want to spend more time with her. Oh, 48 years married. Still... <laughs> wow. I still kiss her. I still love her. Mm, I still open the door for her because the, she's the queen of my house. Amen. I want all my grandchildren to see what I do to their grandmother. And um, as I said, I've got five biological children and 13 adopted children. And they all love the Lord. And I thank God for each one of them. Now, John chapter 5, I want to base also my testimony from these scriptures. Chapter 5, verse 1 to 6. Some time later, NIV translation. Some time later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem to a feast of the Jews. Now there in Jerusalem near the ship gate, a pool which is in Aramic is called Bethsaida and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who, was, who, one who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. For 38 years on one spot. That made me curious the moment I said, God, I just want to go and see that place. Because I didn't go to Bible college. I didn't go to school. I was never educated I didn't have the privilege of going to school. I didn't know how to read and write. And so I started reading when I was 22 years old for the first time. So the first book I ever read was the Bible. And I was a, like a crazy young boy after Jesus opened my eyes right there under the bush. And I ran into the streets stopping everyone. Am I reading? He said, yes, you are reading. Am I reading? Yes, man. I was like a mad young guy. But I was, I thank God because that day I was a real fool for Jesus. Some of you are fools for the devil. But when you are a fool for Jesus, man, it's exciting. Wow. You don't get ashamed because you are a fool of the king of kings. Amen. So here, <coughs> here they were, all these people who are lame. So I went there. I said, God, just I want to start by seeing. 
So I've gone to Egypt, traveled around across Egypt, preaching from city to city for three months, preaching every day in different churches and so on. Thousands of people coming to Christ. Some people of other religions coming to Christ. But God was doing something into my life to learn what I've been reading from the Bible. And it was good to go and see where Jesus was hidden as a young baby. Also to climb the Mount, uh, Mount Sinai to go where the Ten Commandments came from. And also to see where uh, Israel crossed the Red Sea and the Jordan. All this place, it was a Bible college for me. But God is wonderful. Here I went to see this place just to admire what happened to this man that for 38 years on one spot, doing the same thing all the time. During rain season in Malawi, in Malawi because we don't have, you know, like fences and so on, all the fields are green, the maize, man, the crops are beautiful. So what we do from November to end of March, all the goats are tied to the tree because they don't want them to go and eat the crops. So they tie them around the tree. So they'll be eating around this tree, round and round and round and round for three months. But when March comes, all the crops have been harvested and you untie that, uh, that, uh, that goat without a rope, it will still go round and round and round. Because it's been used like a habit of going round and round and round. So Jesus, when he came, he came to deliver the captives. But unfortunately, people, though they were deliver the soul to go round and round and round. It's a habit that people need complete deliverance. Are we together, church? Complete deliverance. I was born again on Sunday. Jesus saved me, but my old character was still appearing upon my life. I was still going round and round and round on the same habits the same habits, and I still was short-tempered. I was born again. I love the Lord, but the anger, the rage of tempers used to come, and they wrapped like something. I remember this white missionary was trying to teach me how to write one plus one. Now, to teach a guy who is already 22 years old one plus one, and also how to hold a pen. And it was difficult. The way I hold the pen is not the way other people hold the pen. I hold it between these four fingers. And so I write the best handwriting in the whole world. And some of you students, you are, your writing started well, but as you went by, it went crooked. You don't know how to read it. <clears throat> but, you know, I was going round and round. So you would say, man, Steve, this is a silly thing to do. Who I would grab his shirt and said, I'll kill you. <laughs> My old Stephen was erupting, coming out. I'll kill you. Why did you say silly? For me, silly was a bad word. To say stupid was a bad word. So the old Stephen was still going round and round and round. I preached the gospel. Many people came to Christ, but I still had a problem inside me. I still like, I thought I had a rope going round and round and round. So many of us struggle with the, with the things of the past. You have never been delivered with things of the past. Your old habits. You came to Christ, but still you are struggling with the past around you. Your generational cases, the things of the past, they haunt you. And you wonder why. And some of us, we had, like, like my father was a man who never stayed with one woman. He 
married the first wife, divorced, second wife, divorced. He was not staying with all this, up to about 11 wives. My mother was wife number eight. And it was, my father was in the military for First World War and Second World War. But the way he ran his marriage, he was still a major in the military. He controlled my mother like a military major. So the past of my father was still haunting him. But the person who suffered was my mother. And uh, she was, you know, in the receiving end of the past of my father. So many people suffer because of the things of the past. Some people come from first marriage, but when they go into the second marriage, they suffer with the instances of the first marriage, they impact the second marriage. That's why you need to deal the things of the first marriage first because before you go into the second. Are we together, church? And so when you do that, you are being uh, delivered completely. So here, I look at this place. When I went there, there's a tree somewhere people used to gather or sit, wait for the angel to come and stir up the water. <clears throat> this man could not walk, could not help himself. The only way was to roll himself as the water was said, to roll himself into the water. But as he was doing that, someone would jump in. The first to jump was healed instantly. But this man struggled day one, day two, day three, first year, 10 years, 20 years, 35 years doing the same thing. 35 years doing the same thing. How old are you? The age you are, sometimes you are 20, 18, but doing the same thing round and round and round. Tonight is the night you are going to new, write a new history. I say tonight you are going to write a new history to start a new destiny of your life, to start a life of complete deliverance from everything of the past. Hallelujah. Tonight is your day because God is going to do something in your life. And I had to pass through that. I had to pass through that myself. <clears throat> and and, uh, and when I got saved, I still didn't trust white people. I was saved. I loved Jesus. But inside me, when I saw a white man, inside me, I would Life, how are you saying? Hello, praise God. But inside, he must die. <laughs> there was still hatred uh, against the white man. I was smiling, but inside, there was murder. I was still murdering people, although I was born again. So I, I needed to find deliverance of my past. And so, at this day, for 35 years or 38 years, 38 years, the man on the same post, you know, you get used, you become your mindset that today and today again, tomorrow again, the mindset that, you know, is tuned to the same things all the time. And it was this day thinking that it would be going as usual then as is there, listen to this. <clears throat> Listen to this. When Jesus, when Jesus, wow, I love this. <laughs> not when any president, not any prophet, not any preacher, but when Jesus, when Jesus appears in your situation, your hopeless situation becomes hope. Are we together? Your hopeless situation created there, when Jesus arrives, hope is created. So Jesus stands when Jesus saw him lying there. God, Jesus, learned the situation of that person. 
he says he learned that he, uh, verse, verse uh, 5, when Jesus came there, he asked, I beg your pardon, when Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, man, he says, wow, this man has been in this condition for a long time. Maybe you have been in the condition you tell lies, but it has been your condition for a long time. You look at other tribes or nationalities, you have been in that condition for a long time. You still want to commit suicide because you are depressed. You have been in that condition for a long time. You, when you are hurt, you take a long time to forgive because you have been on that condition for a long time. Any situation you struggle with, to move with the Lord Jesus, you have been in that condition for a long time. You find it hard to forgive. And for me too, although I was born again, I had vowed that the day I'll see my father, I'll kill him. The day I'll see my mother, I'll kill her. Why did she bring me in this world? I was in that condition for a long time. But when Jesus, I love this, hey, when Jesus, oh, hey, are we together? When Jesus, where there's no hope, brings hope, he turns that hopeless situation into something good. Hallelujah. When he turns it around, it turns into joy. Man, when you have got that joy, you don't become a donkey Christian. No. Donkeys are always like this. There's no rejoicing, long face. No. When Jesus appears, all your situation changes. Hallelujah. The way you worship God changes because Jesus has brought hope. When there's hope, there's joy. When there's joy, you are unstoppable. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Who can stop you? Who can stop you when Jesus brings hope into your life? Who can stop you? <laughs> That's what happened to me. And so, Jesus stopped there, learned that he had been in this condition for a long time. <laughs> he asked him a question. Ooh, I like that. <laughs> Look at him. Let's visualize him sleeping there in his mind. Again, another day. Another day. The same thing. The same thing. As the angels will come, I'll try to struggle, struggle to go in. Another day. Oh, man. He's thinking. But now someone stands on the top of his head. And he's thinking, oh, he's... These guys always come, you know, some to chat with me. But this man does the strangest thing. He says, do you want to get well? <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Tonight, listen to that voice. Do you want to get well from your situation, from your life, which is very religious? There are many people who go on religion round and round they go around religion round and round and round. <laughs> There's no excitement when they go to church. They are so boring. But when he comes, he will ask the question, like tonight, he will ask you the question, do you want to get well? Do you want to be saved? Do you want to be born again into the kingdom of God? Do you want to be saved? Some, you know, they will look, after 30 years, they will look at the men, zip their mouths. They won't say anything. And some, they will do that. They will look at their friends. Ah, should I be saved? No, they, as if this person is God. <laughs> no, don't look at the person next to you. Look inside you and say, hey, my life has been going around and around. And around. I've been going to church in and out, in and out. You remember that day I told you that story <coughs> of my brother and I? 
when we were poor, we used to pick up food from the garbage bins and would eat from the garbage bins and would take some pap and put it on the newspaper and go to the river to fish. But my brother, who would they be there would catch a big fish and I would catch a frog. And my brother, another big fish, and me, another frog. My brother, another big fish, and me, another third frog. So because I was thin like a mosquito, my brother was big and tough and so on, like a rugby player. So I was afraid of my young brother because he was left-handed. You know, left-handed, when they beat you, it's like a scud missile. <coughs> so I was saying, hey, if he beats me, I'm gone. I'm really gone. So how can I chase him away where he's sitting? Because all the fishes are there. So I took one frog, tied the legs, and start operating it, you know, to look at the intensity while he's uh, alive. Ah, and my brother, hey, don't do that. Thing. So he moved away. So I moved to where he was sitting. I said, yeah, that's good. <laughs> then my brother, there, he caught a big fish. Me, another frog again. <laughs> so I took this frog, tied the legs of the frog, and it hopped and hopped and hopped into the water. And I pulled it out into the water, and I would pull it out into the water, and out. So it was going in and out, in and out. <laughs> That's what the devil does. He ties your heart with religion. And you go into the church and out, into the church and out, into the church and out, doing the same things over and over and over. You don't, know, you don't enjoy worship. Worship, when we raise hands, it's like, e -e, what are these people doing? E -e, I've never done this in my church. <laughs> you need to be set loose <laughs> to worship God properly. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> when you were, I was enjoying guys kneeling down, not even a, a, an iota of shame, because worshiping God is what I love. Amen. So, <laughs> many people, they are going in and out, in and out. Remember, the devil has never stopped someone to be baptized. He says, go and be baptized. He has never stopped anyone to eat Holy Communion. He said, go and eat Holy Communion. He has never stopped anybody to wear a collar like a pastor. He has never stopped anyone to become a prophet. He says, go, be a prophet, but, but don't go as far as the cross. Because when you go to the cross, all this pride vanishes. Because you've come to the foot of the cross. Hallelujah. All these people who are messing around with religion and so on, preaching prophets, are pro only if they come to the foot of the cross, everything will be gone. This pride will be gone. But now they are going round and round and round. And people, when you preach, when you are going round, all the people who follow you, they also go round and round and round. But now, 25 minutes to go. 20 minutes to go. Minus one, 19. <laughs> so Jesus says, do you want to get well? What a question. Listen to this man, what the answer, where he answers, he said, sir, sir, the invalid pride, I have no one to help me into the pool. I have no one to help me in the pool. It's true, my brother, my sister. You had no one to send you into the pool pool. But today is different because the owner of the pool, the owner of the angel who stirs water is here. He says, do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? So he says, sir, I have no one <coughs> to help me into the pool. When the water is stirred, while I am trying, listen to what he's saying, 
I cried when I had read this. When I am trying, when I'm trying to go, someone goes in. <laughs> he tried 38 years. Something went wrong. He says, when I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. How many people have been going ahead of you? When we preach the gospel, when my brothers preach the gospel, they are ahead of you coming forward to accept Jesus. And God deals with their situations and God changes their history right here in front. And God is going to do the same to you today. I said God is going to do the same to you. <laughs> I'm excited. Because today, many people said, I'm tired of trying. I'm tired of going round and round. I want something new in my life. Something to happen to me today. And God is going to do it. And I promise you, he's going to do it. He did it for me. He will do it for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, I told you I didn't like white people, but one day God I said, no, I want to surrender everything to you, to you. And God did it in my life. <coughs> and he used the, some Africaners in Pretoria to beat me severely. I was unconscious. And in the hospital, while I was unconscious, God spoke to me. He said, Stephen, are you ready to forgive the Africana? Oh, it was tough. But I said, yes, Lord. The moment I said, yes, Lord, it was like a cement of unforgiveness was removed out of my chest. And I said, yes, Lord. And immediately I said, yes, Lord. I regained my consciousness. But now the problem the first person to see me was a white nurse. <laughs> oh, I said, what happened to you? I said, no, you don't, know what to, you don't want to know what happened to me. She insisted. <clears throat> but I explained, ooh, the young nurse cried with anger, banging the table. I hit my people. I hit my people. I said, no, no, no. You don't. I've just forgiven your people. <laughs> Hallelujah. I've forgiven your people. And then with this nurse, we became friends. And she invited many other nurses. While I was sick there, they brought some flowers, chocolates. You know, I ate chocolate I've never eaten before. <laughs> and so we, I started a Bible study with the nurses as a patient. But uh, I was a, a preacher of the gospel among the nurses. I took that opportunity to start that Bible study. And God blessed me. And then I wrote a letter to the white people who beat me. And after seven months, we reconciled with those white Africaners. And they are my best, best friends. I like Africaners very much. Whether you like it or not, but I love you. I love you every bit of me. Loves an African man. He praised Yere. Yere is hot, man. Eh? <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> That's what go, how God gave me the forgiveness. Now, when I did that, three years later, because God had prepared me, as I preached in Harare, thousands of people came forward. I'm praying for the sick and people getting healed and so on. One lady jumped up. I'm healed and so on. And she comes to me. He says, please, I've got one more prayer. I said, what is your problem? And this woman said, the testimony you shared tonight, I'm your mother who dumped you. 51 years later, the same boy she dumped, the same boy led her to Jesus. God gave me the spirit of forgiveness to my own mother. And later on, I found my father when he was 98. First time finding my father, led him to Jesus. And oh, when my father died, I preached at my father's funeral. In my culture, is a taboo to preach at your father's funeral. It's not allowed. I said, no, they are my children in the Lord. I led my father to the Lord, so he's my son. <laughs> 
Then I led my mother to the Lord. I preached. 4,000 people came to Jesus at my mother's funeral. So I take at the funeral. To me, it's, it's a crusade. <laughs> Hallelujah. The spirit of forgiveness, when God comes into your life, changes it. Do you want to get well? He said, yes, Lord, I want to get well. That's where I'm coming from and where God has done in my life after living a life of rejection at the age of four, rejected by mother, father, lived under a bridge, feeding from the garbage bins, started stabbing, stabbing someone at the age of 10, I mean 12, and get revolvers as a gang leader, notorious gang leader. <coughs> For me, killing someone was no big deal. That was killing a chicken. Because I was rejected, there's no way I could give love to someone. I even told my gang members that you never laugh in my gang. The day you laugh, I'll kill you. So I was unpredictable among my gang members. Because I, I never laughed from the age of six. I never laughed. I was always serious, unpredictable. One day my friend was laughing, going around the corner and I followed him. Why are you laughing? And I pulled my gun and shot him on his leg just for laughing. I was an angry boy away from God. I didn't like the name Jesus because it identified with white people. So I couldn't worship a white man's God. I didn't like the Bible because it was a white man's book to brainwash the black people. And so my life went on and on. And as a gorilla fight in the bush, we used to say there's no God, there's no God. Until when I was 20 years old, <clears throat> where I was given a, a TNT bomb to go and plant it in the bank that on Monday morning, White people go to that bank, the bomb would explode. So I was excited that day that many white people are going to die. You are very safe tonight, don't worry. <laughs> I see white people getting afraid. <laughs> you know, when white people are afraid, they become red, red, red. <laughs> and we black people become pitch black. <laughs> So I went there, but we saw a big, massive tent and thousands of people there of the Dorothea mission. And we went there not to hear the word of God, but to spray bullets to everyone in the tent. As we got there, we decided to go inside for two minutes. Now, when you give two minutes to God, that's enough. And we went inside, and they were singing choruses. We, we disturbed the meeting. And then suddenly, they invited a pretty girl from Soweto. She was gorgeous. She put me off balance. Ma, she was very, very pretty. I said, now, how can a pretty girl become a Christian? I used to think Christianity is for the old, old grannies who are about to die. Or oh, ugly girls with the wrong figures and so on. So because they were so ugly, they had to be Christians. <laughs> and so as I listened there, this girl shining, glowing, she invites another black evangelist from Pretoria, Shadrach Maluka, stood up. He read two scriptures, John 3, verse 16, and two Corinthians. Chapter 8, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus, that though he was rich, he became poor, that through his poverty, you may be rich in Christ. And he was crying. He started preaching the word of God. That love, those tears in that preacher, as he preached about the love of God, first time, my eyes were open to see Jesus. My brothers, my sister, there's no way you can see Jesus remain the same. Never. You can't see Jesus and remain the same. Hallelujah. That day I didn't see a white man. I saw the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. And as he preached the word, 
And when he spoke about the judgment of God, that's the part of the message I didn't like. Because as he preached about the judgment of God, I didn't like his finger. Every time he pointed the finger, as if the finger was bending towards me. And he would point this way, the finger was bending towards me. I said, now this man doesn't know how to preach. Why is the finger always bending towards me? He points upwards like it is bending towards me. So I said, no, this man doesn't know how to preach. So when he would put, do like this, I would duck down behind someone's back. And I was going up and down, up and down. But that night, I broke down in tears. I was under deep conviction that I'm tired going round and round and round. I'm tired living my lifestyle. I'm tired to be in religion. I'm tired of all these things. Tonight, I'm trying Jesus. Tonight, I'm trying Jesus. So I stood up from my back with my AK-47, my bombs, hand grenades, as I came forward. And I grabbed the legs of that preacher. His trousers were soaked wet as I cried for mercy that night. I said, God, I'm tired, going round and round and round. Today, God, please, let me not miss you. I've missed you several times, but tonight is my night. Even you, my brother, sister, tonight is your night. I say tonight is your night. Hallelujah. That night, when the bomb exploded by another gang, people were running away, many people were hurt and so dead, and that night I was the only boy with long hair, uncombed, with lies, I was stinking, smelling. My shorts had two windows at the back. Never worn shoes before. When I came for even the preacher had to use his handkerchief on his nose because I was stinking. The Stephen you see today this is the grace of God. Just the grace of God. Just the nothing else. No education. But that night became my night. Became my night. The life of going round and round stopped that day. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. As I close, that night as I gave my life to Jesus, they read me Psalm 27 verse 10. Though your mother and your father forsake you, but God will receive you. And the night I felt like God was embracing me. Although you are smelling, Stephen, I love you. Look what I did for you on the cross. I was remembering you on the cross. Like that thief on the cross, Jesus, remember me. Remember me when you go into your kingdom. Jesus said, tonight, today, you'll be with me in paradise. What an assurance. What an assurance. Today you'll be with me in paradise. God wants to give you that promise tonight. And you have said, God, tonight I've been playing church. Tonight I've been going round and round. Tonight my life has never been changed. I've been going on the same way. But tonight, God, I want that freedom. And tonight, I want to be baptized by the Spirit of God. Maybe you are here, you come to Shofar, you have never experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Tonight is your night. I said, tonight is your night. Where you really worship God in truth and in spirit. And Jesus is standing by you. Do you want to get well? Brothers, yes. 